Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to class. Can you hear me clearly? Okay, thank you, Nikhil. Yes, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Uh, can I ask uh, one of you to please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Can I ask Shiv Kumar to lead us in prayer? Shiv Kumar? Shiv Kumar, are you there? Or Anthony, Arilla, anyone can lead us in prayer, please? Anthony is there. Shiv Kumar. Okay, uh, can I ask uh, Nina John to lead us in prayer, please? Hello, you're able to hear me? Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can, yes. Gracious, loving Father, thank you for this day, Lord, and for this time that you have given us to study your word, to learn from you, Lord. We thank you for all that you have been uh, teaching us in this particular subject, Lord, and that we have been blessed. We pray today also, we commit ourselves, Pastor Serena, into your hands, that they would uh, be anointing and we would really learn and grow in our knowledge of you and our understanding of you. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Nina John. Okay. So last week we uh, looked at uh, the lessons, The Sinless Lamb of God, where we looked at uh, the title and the role of Jesus as that sinless Lamb of God. And we looked at... Uh, various Old Testament sacrifices and how, you know, we see that Jesus was the type and shadow of the redemptive work uh, that he came to do to accomplish in the New Testament, which we see and we read about, uh, which was already uh, prophesied, uh, which was already foretold and things were put in place, which was a type and the shadow of the redemptive work of uh, Jesus Christ, which we look at in uh, the New Testament or, you know, the coming of Jesus, how his incarnation, how he lived here um, on the earth. So we see that all of the rituals or all of the celebrations, uh, including the Passover, how Jesus was uh, uh, the Paschal Lamb or the uh, Passover Lamb, and how the Old Testament feast of the Passover uh, was a type and shadow of uh, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Uh, we also saw other sacrifices that uh, were, uh, which God had, uh, you know, put into place in the religious system of the Israelites, like the morning and the evening sacrifice, and you know the other sacrifices like uh, the guilt offering, the trespass offering. Uh, we also looked in uh, chapters uh, six and seven about. Uh, uh, you know the atone the, uh, the the atonement sacrifice on the day of atonement. How Jesus was even you know the one who fulfilled uh, that in himself in his work on the uh, cross. So all of these rituals, these sacrifices, has a greater significance, greater meaning because it was a type, which means it was a pattern or a model that was uh, followed or seen in. Uh, the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross and was shadow means a shadow is something that is uh, or something that is substantial and uh, you know it is uh, it is talking about the heavenly rea realities that we can see here or experience here um, on the earth so the shadow is that and how Jesus uh, was uh, uh, the one who came and fulfilled uh, all of these things so you know everything that uh, G that God had actually um, 
purposed and brought about the laws, the commandments, uh, the rituals, the sacrifices, the, the feasts that they had to celebrate, uh, you know, uh, had a, 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 a much greater significance than just what meets the eye or what was uh, what they had was what the Israelites were supposed to do. It had a everlasting uh, consequence, everlasting significance, and that is why uh, God tells them, you know, all of these sacrifices and rituals, you will even the Passover, you know, you will do it as a lasting ordinance or an everlasting, uh, you know, uh, uh, covenant with uh, with me, and it was. You know, uh, why it was told was because it was pointing out to the, the work of Jesus um, on the cross and how Jesus became that, um, uh, you know, sin bearer, the sin offering for us. He made that one sacrifice uh, for sin once for all, forever. Uh, and um, the reason that he could do this for us was because he was holy, he was sinless, he was undefiled, and by offering up himself as a sacrifice, we see that he brought an end to all of the sacrifices that God had ordained or commanded the people in the Old Testament to do, which was the, and all the celebrations which they had to do as well, which was the Passover uh, celebration, the Passover feast and the others. Uh, and also the, the atoning sacrifice, the morning and the evening sacrifices, which was the daily sacrifices, and also the trespass offering or the guilt offering that we had uh, studied uh, in the last class. So why was able uh, for uh, why was able why was Christ able to do all of these things? Was because he was one with the Father. Uh, he was fully surrendered, fully consecrated. Um, and he was sinless, and hence he was able to make that full, sufficient, and perfect uh, sacrifice. And we also saw in the last class that, you know, Scripture talks about Jesus' uh, uh, sacrifice on the cross uh, as, you know, uh, as one being the suffering lamb. You know, Christ was is mentioned not only as the... Um, suffering servant uh, we saw in Isaiah, uh, but also he is the suffering lamb, which means that, uh, you know, uh, he was not only the sinless lamb uh, who was sinless and who was able to make that perfect sacrifice, he was not just the suffering servant, but he was also the suffering lamb, which means, you know, he uh, being, he, he uh, who made the sacrifice for us, he who was that perfect lamb of God uh, to take away the sins of the, of the whole world. You know, he went through all the afflictions. He was oppressed. Uh, he was uh, reviled, which means he was criticized very, very strongly. He was beaten. He was spat at. He was spoken and said unpleasant things. But yet he did not revile in return, which we looked at in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 35, was because, you know, he became that uh, sacrifice uh, uh, that was the suffering lamb who willingly and very passively bore uh, the penalty for our sins or took upon himself uh, our sin. And he did it very willingly. And he did it very passively, which means he did not retaliate, he did not uh, uh, resist, but he just gave himself up and he became that willing, passive uh, sacrifice because he bore the penalty for our uh, sins. And also we saw that, you know, Christ became the suffering lamb so that he could make uh, his life as an offering uh, for our sins. He could make his life as a trespass offering uh, as a guilt um, offering, which had to be made uh, to please or, you know, to justify us and to make us righteous uh, before God and to atone for our sins, okay? So that is what we looked at um, uh, in the last class when we studied Jesus as the sinless lamb, uh, as that Passover lamb, as that lamb who was... Uh, uh, you know, sacrifice morning and evening daily, the daily sacrifices, and as the trespass offering, uh, 
uh, or the guilt offering that was made. Okay. So any questions uh, about uh, what we studied last class? Anyone has any questions? I hope you all uh, read through your notes. Any questions anyone has? OK, if there are no questions, then we'll move on uh, to the next lesson, where we're going to talk about his substitutionary uh, suffering. OK, so we looked at Jesus as the sinless lamb. Uh, we looked at him as, uh, you know, the suffering lamb. But we will also look at him as, you know, somebody who whose suffering was substitutionary. Now, what is the meaning of this word uh, substitutionary? Anyone knows what is the meaning of substitutionary or when we say that uh, Jesus' uh, suffering on the cross was a substitutionary suffering, what do we mean? Uh, you can unmute your mics and speak. I can hear. What does it mean by when we say that Jesus' suffering was substitutionary? In place of us, Taking our place, I okay. mean, what, yeah. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, the, essentially that taking our place in the sense like he didn't deserve any any of what happened, but he took our place uh, as an offering. Because uh, in the Old Testament, when we look, I mean, there was always a sacrifice necessary whenever there was any sin committed. And it still did not really cleanse uh, the person completely from the inner core of the being. So, but then uh, he became that perfect sacrifice in our place, and so there is. So in that way, he's, he that's a substitutionary act, an act of intercession that he did. He took that, uh, did that final sacrifice, so that we don't have to make any more sacrifices. We just have to trust in him. And go so essentially taking our place is what I thought. Thank you, Nina John. Yes, anyone else likes to add to what Nina John has said? Okay, the word uh, substitution basically means you know it's uh, an act or it's the process. Uh, or the result of substituting one thing for the um, other. So, you know, uh, when Jesus died on the cross, uh, you know, uh, and he bore our sins, he took upon himself our sins. It's something that, you know, we had to do. He took our place. Uh, he was doing what we should have done. He was taking upon himself uh, the sins that we should have borne uh, ourselves or we should bear ourselves. Uh, he took upon himself the suffering that we had to suffer and uh, he took upon himself the payment for sin or he through his life paid for our sins what we should have done, what we should uh, be paying for. So in those terms, you know, uh, Jesus uh, made the substitutionary suffering, which means he took our place. So we had to die. He died for us. You know, we had to pay the debts for our sins, but he paid the debts for our sins. We had to go through all that suffering uh, as a consequences for our sin, but he took upon himself our suffering. We had to bear um, uh, the consequences of a sin, or we had to bear our sins, but he uh, bore it for us. So in this lesson, Basically, we will be discussing Christ's suffering. Uh, we will be focusing upon uh, his substitutionary work on the cross, how he took our place, what he accomplished for us, what he purchased for us, what he uh, did as a result of him taking our place, and uh, how you know he delivered us and what he purchased uh, for us. So Christ on the cross, you know, uh, took upon himself our sins, uh, he took upon, he became a curse for us, 
uh, because you know he took upon himself our curses because of our sin. Uh, he also took upon himself our grief, our sorrows, uh, our sicknesses, our iniquities, our transgressions, our shame, our pain, everything. And uh, he also tasted death on our behalf. You know, it was the consequence of sin is death. And Jesus, you know, died in place of us. He tasted death uh, for us so that uh, instead of that, we could receive the life of God. So he died in our place so that we can receive all that is his, which means we can receive righteousness, we can receive justification, uh, we can receive a redemption, our sins can be atoned for, uh, you know, the power of sin is broken over our, our lives, uh, we are no longer under the curse of sin, the curse uh, uh, of uh, death, but we receive the fullness of life, we receive the slow way life of God, the God kind of life. Um, uh, we also, uh, you know, are not uh, uh, receiving eternal damnation, but eternal life. Uh, we are also no longer slaves of uh, Satan, but we are uh, now sons and daughters uh, of God. We are part of the kingdom of God. We are a chosen race, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a people be belonging to God. So it was actually uh, like we uh, looked at in the previous chapter, it was, you know, a divine exchange that took over on the cross. So whatever was ours, uh, Jesus took upon himself, in which, which means he's, he took our place, he substituted in our place, and we, uh, as his people, as his children, have this, you know, awesome privilege of, uh, you know, uh, coming into his place or taking his place to the extent where, you know, we are in right standing with God, which means that when God looks at us, you know, uh, he uh, he loves us just like he loves his son. So we are in right standing with Jesus because when God looks at us, he looks at us the same way he looks at us, uh, at his son. Uh, he loves us just the same way he loves his, his son. Isn't that just so, uh, you know, something that we can't even understand, we can't even comprehend, something that is so great, something that is so... Um, uh, so, you know, unimaginable that, you know, who are we that God looks at us in the same level that he looks at as his son? He loves us in the same way that he loves his son when, you know, we are absolutely, even though we have uh, accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, even as we are children of God, we are part of his kingdom, but uh, we, because of our frailties, our weaknesses, you know, fail to live up to that righteous standard. We fail to live up to that holy standard. We fail to love God as we ought to love him uh, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind and strength. But yet, you know, there's never a moment in our lives when God looks down upon us or he does not love us just as he loves us as his son. Or there's never a moment he says, hey, I'm so fed up with you, you know, uh, I've given you everything, I've done everything for you, you've uh, tasted eternal life, tasted my goodness and my blessings, but, you know, day in and day out, you keep going back and doing, uh, you know, the same little, little sins or that, you know, going back to your old sinful nature and he doesn't just push us off uh, from our position or, you know, just doesn't overlook us or, you know, hide his face from us or gives us that stare which makes us look like, you know, feeling so condemned, uh, demeaned in his sight, but just his eyes looks at us in such a loving fashion, in such a, you know, gracious manner. I don't know if uh, it, this, this whole thing makes so much of a sense, makes so much of, uh, brings so much of grandeur to our lives, so much of meaning, so much of purpose. Uh, you know, I'm sure in life when we have done something wrong, we have received that you know, look from our parents or that uh, look from our, uh, 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 our teachers or from the principal, you know, and we that's totally sent a shiver down our spine or we totally scared or, you know, that look from our boss where it's like, hey, what have you done, you know? I mean, this is not what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, that, that, that sense of, oh, 
again you've disappointed me you know but when god looks at us he does not even look at us in that manner he just looks at us with such loving looks with such loving eyes in spite of us you know uh, sinning uh, over and over um, again and that is just so wonderful of this god that we have this god that we know this god that has uh, delivered us from darkness into his marvelous light so even as we are studying you know about christ incarnation what christ has done for us um, his title and his role as a sinless lamb as the you know suffering servant as the substitutionary suffering that he made for us on the cross i just hope it it brings a life you know really what god has done for us and uh, just you know uh, consecrating our lives, giving our lives wholly back to him in total surrender, in total submission, uh, in total love to this God who loves us uh, in a way that we cannot even think, comprehend, or uh, imagine. And that is what God is uh, looking for. He's not looking for us in doing just great things for him, but all he wants us is to be totally you know, surrendered, obedient, doing his will, uh, just totally in love with him in everything that uh, we do and hope that is a kind of response that we'll get even as you know uh, we are studying all of this and drawing and uh, to uh, you know draw an end to the course you know uh, this should be our attitude this should be our uh, response otherwise all that we have studied all that christ has done uh, will have no significance and meaning because we will um, you know, be living again in deep condemnation and guilt which the enemy throws at us because he knows that we have not come to that place where we totally understood what God has done for us or we can totally see what God has done for us and live in that light of what he has done. So it's so important for us to live in the light of what Christ has done, achieve for us, purchase for us, where he has brought us, where he has made us stand, uh, and just look at it in that whole um, fullness of what he has done and live in that uh, so that, you know, uh, uh, we are just, uh, our lives are just pleasing and holy and in total love and surrender uh, uh, to him, okay? So here on the cross, there's a divine exchange that took place and we need to be mindful of what the divine exchange is, what we have received, and how we need to walk in that and live in that. That is important. So studying this course is not just because you have to get a certificate or, you know, uh, you have to pass this course uh, where well, that is one of the things, but this whole course should just, you know, uh, bring alive everything that who Christ is, uh, what he has done, and how we can live in what he has purchased, what he has done for us, uh, and just live in that fullness. Because just imagine, you know, uh, as a parent or as a friend, you know, you uh, you buy something for your uh, child or you buy something for your spouse or for your friend or for your parent uh, uh, or someone who you love very much and they don't seem to use it. Every time you ask them, say, yeah, it's lying there, you know, I'll use it one day. I mean, it's just going to, you know, break your heart. Say, hey, I spent so much of time, uh, money, effort in going and picking this up, getting this, and this person doesn't seem to uh, value it. So just imagine how it breaks the father heart of God, uh, how it would have broken his heart to see his son you know, take on the sins of the world, suffer, and uh, the pain that Christ went through and just looking at us, you know, not valuing uh, what they have done, what they have uh, purchased for us, what they have redeemed us out of, and how we are like those Israelites sometimes, how I am like that Israelite sometimes, you know, going back to Egypt, sometimes coming to the promised land, going back to Egypt, coming back to the promised land, you know, wanting to be in slavery to sin sometimes, wanting to be in freedom some, sometimes, and you know how it just breaks the father heart of god so it's important for us to open our eyes to see these truths uh, to live in it and uh, to walk in it okay so uh, the main aspect or the primary aspect of uh, christ uh, substitutionary sacrifice which means he taking our place making the sacrifice on behalf of us uh, is uh, that that the one 
making the sacrifice, you know, fully identifies with us. So when Christ made that substitutionary sacrifice on behalf of us, uh, it was something that, you know, he made uh, where he fully identifies with us, uh, you know, and uh, uh, he fully identifies in the sense that he became man, you know, he had the same weaknesses, the frailties that we had, yet he was sinless. So the primary aspect of this substitutionary sacrifice is that the one making the sacrifice, you know, fully identifies with us. So Christ fully identifies in our sins, in our sufferings, in our weaknesses, in our pain, in our sorrows, in our brokenness, uh, because he is making the sacrifice on behalf of uh, us. And also as Christ making the substitutionary sacrifice, the primary aspect is that, you know, um, he suffered uh, with us or along with us in our adversities, in our, uh, you know, in our uh, difficulties, in our um, hardships, in our dangers, uh, in our sorrows, in our pain. And he took upon all of these uh, burdens, he took upon all of these evil upon himself. So this, the primary aspect of the substitutionary sacrifice is that Christ fully identifies with us. He who made the sacrifice on behalf of us identifies uh, with our suffering, with our hardships, our difficulties, our sorrows, our pains, uh, our sicknesses, our burdens, and all the curses and the evil that befall us because of uh, uh, the consequence of sin and because of uh, sin. Isn't that so beautiful that, you know, uh, Christ could have come in the form of God um, and maybe he could have done something to take on the sins of the whole world, but he became man, he became one like us, he identified with us, and everything that he suffered, he suffered in the human body, uh, and hence he knows all of our sufferings, our sorrows, and our pain. So there is no one uh, like Jesus who understands our pain, our sorrows, and uh, in that way, you know, he... Uh, uh, was our uh, substitutionary uh, sacrifice. He substituted in our uh, place. He did what we had to do. He did it for us. So we look at what he did for us on the cross. Uh, so can somebody please read Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 uh, to 6, please? Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 to 6. Francis, can you please read Isaiah 53, 4 to 6 loudly for us, please? Isaiah 53, 4 to 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for your translation. He was braced for our iniquities. That judgment for our peace was upon him. And by his by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Amen. Thank you, Francis. So in this passage uh, in Isaiah chapter 53, which is part of uh, the suffering uh, songs of the, the servant songs of the uh, suffering Messiah. This is one of the servant songs that we uh, read in Isaiah chapter, uh, it starts from Isaiah chapter 52, it goes on till uh, Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, so here it's talking about the substitutionary work of uh, Christ in verses uh, 4 to 6 of Isaiah chapter 53. And if you look at these, um, this, this whole uh, passage, it says he bore our grief, sorrow. He was wounded for our transgressions. 
he was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment needed to obtain our peace was upon him. By his stripes, you know, he provided our healing and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. So the Lord laid on him all our iniquity. So here very clearly it shows the substitutionary work of Christ. So if somebody asks you, where do we see in the Bible uh, Jesus' substitutionary work? Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 to 6 where it talks about how he bore our grief, our sorrow, our transgression, our iniquities. Um, you know, and uh, our punishment, uh, our sicknesses, our iniquities. And because of him, you know, we receive the peace, the healing, and the forgiveness for our uh, sins. So it was our place that Christ uh, took upon himself. He did everything on the cross on our behalf, on each, because of each one of us. And this was his substitutionary. Uh, suffering. So we look at uh, some of these uh, words uh, and understand in depth what he really uh, did for us on the cross, what was his substitutionary work for us on the cross, his substitutionary suffering for us on the cross. So on the cross he bore uh, grief. Now the Greek, uh, the, the word for uh, uh, bone or bore is, you know, uh, Nasa in Hebrew, and it basically means, you know, bore means to remove, uh, to a distance, to lift, to cast away, to take away. Uh, so, you know, when Jesus bore our grief, our sorrows, our transgressions, our iniquities, our sicknesses, he basically, he removed it off to a distance, so took it away to a distance. He lifted it from us. He took it away from us. He cast it away um, from us. And look at the different things that uh, Jesus bore on the cross for us. He bore our grief. Um, uh, the, the Hebrew word for this grief means sickness. So basically, it's not just grief in the sense of, you know, grieving for the loss of someone, grieving for uh, a brokenness or pain. Uh, it's not just talking about that. It's here the word grief means uh, talking about sickness. So he bore on himself or he took away, he lifted away, he cast away our sicknesses. Uh, and the word sorrows, he carried our sorrows. So the Hebrew word for sorrows means pain, which means on the cross, Jesus, you know, took upon himself or bore uh, uh, our, our sicknesses, grief, which means sicknesses, sorrows, which means pain. Uh, he just took it away. He lifted it away. He cast it away. Uh, and so we don't have to carry it in our bodies. We don't have to carry sickness. We don't have to carry pain uh, in our bodies. We don't have to bear sickness. We don't have to bear pain in our bodies because of uh, what Jesus has done. He has borne it upon himself, which means he has taken it away. He has cast it uh, away. So if you look at uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 in uh, the young translation and uh, the Rotherham's translation it reads like this surely our sickness he had borne and our pains he had carried them uh, and the uh, Rotherham's uh, translation says that surely our sickness he carried and as for our pains he bare the burden of them so he on the cross you know, Jesus took our sicknesses, our pain, he just bore it. That means he took it away, he cast it uh, away. Now, he bore our, also our, uh, uh, not only just our sickness, our pain, but also our sins, our transgressions, our iniquities. So what do you know by, uh, or understand uh, by this word transgression or iniquity? Anyone? What's the meaning of this word transgression? Anyone knows the meaning of this word transgression? It's okay even if you are not absolutely right. So you can just try. What is transgression? We've been reading transgression in the Bible a couple of times. You've read it in scripture verses. 
We've heard it preach this word transgression. What's the meaning of transgression? Okay, thank you, Nina John. It's going against the law. Yes. Okay, uh, sin. Another alternative word for uh, for uh, sin uh, is uh, is uh, transgression, because in the New Testament uh, uses well uh, basic words to describe sin. Anthony says transgression is not obeying the word. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Anand says to sin. Okay, thank you. So uh, in the New Testament, uh, you know, we see 12 basic words to describe sin. Uh, there is karkos, which means uh, bad, which we read in Romans chapter 13, verse 3. Phoneros, uh, the Greek word, which means evil. Uh, we read this in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 45. Asbius, which means godless, which we read in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Uh, and then also other words like guilt. Uh, uh, hamatia, which is also sin, unrighteousness, lawlessness, transgression, uh, to be ignorant, to go astray, to fall away, hypocrite. Uh, so all of these, uh, you know, words are used in uh, in in different ways uh, to uh, you know uh, basically talk about or describe what sin is. Okay, so one of the words of these 12 words that are used to describe sin in the New Testament is, uh, is a transgression. Um, and we read this in Romans chapter 5, verse 14, and you know other uh, words as well. But basically, transgression is something that, uh, uh, you know, like Nina John said, is something against a command or a law, going against a command or a law. Uh, whether you are cheating on in a test, or uh, cheating on your spouse, uh, you are committing transgression that is not easily forgiven. Okay, so transgression can be cheating in a test, uh, you know, cheating somebody, uh, cheating on your spouse, and it is something that is not easily forgiven. Uh, a transgression can also be a failure to do your own duty. Uh, uh, it's a sin. A sin is a transgression against God. So sin is also, in a way, it's a transgression uh, because we are breaking God's law, breaking God's word, His commandment, what He has uh, given us. Okay, so that is transgression. What is the meaning of iniquity? Anyone would like to try? What's the meaning of iniquity? Any idea about what iniquity means? Okay, uh, iniquity is basically defined as being wicked or being immoral in, in our nature, in our character. Uh, you know, it's basically not just an action. Yes, iniquity is sin as well, yes. Um, it's not basically uh, an, uh, not an action but the character of an action. So in that way, it's distinguished from a sin uh, because, uh, you know, it's being wicked or immoral in our very nature, uh, in our very character, okay? We are wicked or, uh, or immoral, and uh, it primarily does not basically indicate uh, an action. It's not an action, but the character of an action. So that way it is distinguished from sin. Sin is when we do it in, in action, in deed, uh, but iniquity is just basically our uh, character. Uh, it's our immoral, uh, uh, it's our immoral uh, nature, okay? So uh, the Bible, you know, basically teaches us that the substitutionary work of Jesus on the cross, you know, like we read in Isaiah chapter 53, uh, verses um, uh, four to uh, six, uh, you know, uh, we read the substitutionary work of Christ, what he did for us on the cross. Uh, so the Bible teaches us 
that Jesus, you know, when he took our place, when he died in our place on the cross, he bore our sicknesses, our pain, all our physical ailments that we go through. He bore our, sick, our sins, our punishment. Uh, you know, he took upon all of these things upon himself. He carried this upon himself. And because he has taken it upon himself, you know, he's borne our sins, which means he has, you know, taken it away. He has cast it away. We don't have to, uh, you know, bear it any longer. Uh, what he has carried, you know, we don't have to carry it ourselves. He has just taken it over. We just have to walk and believe and receive that uh, by faith and declare that by faith and just believe that healing, that pain, uh, you know, uh, those curses, everything has been lifted, has been uh, taken away. And so it's so important for us to live in that identity, even when we face sicknesses, when we were uh, you know, when we go through different ailments, when we go through pain, uh, we just stand on this promise of the finished work of the cross, what uh, Christ has done on behalf of us as a substitutionary sacrifice. He has taken our suffering. Uh, he has taken suffering, our suffering upon himself. Um, and, uh, you know, through Christ's substitutionary suffering, you know, we... Uh, have the forgiveness of sins, we have healing in our body, uh, we have peace with God, which means uh, peace here is shalom, uh, which is a very comprehensive word like uh, salvation, so so it's a very holistic, comprehensive uh, word which is fully pregnant in itself, fully full in itself, just the same way shalom uh, just does not mean peace, but it means uh, uh, you know, it means uh, wholeness, it means um, a preservation from harm, uh, danger, it means, uh, you know, wholeness in the mind, wholeness in the body. Uh, it means all of this at the same time. It's, it's just a holistic uh, uh, word. So, you know, he did everything uh, for our wholeness, for our well-being. Uh, uh, and all of this, you know, Christ did, he made it available uh, to us, God made it available to us because of Christ's substitutionary uh, uh, suffering. Isn't that amazing? You know, uh, Christ, uh, God, through Christ Jesus, through his substitutionary suffering on the cross, is, uh, is, is bringing us back to where he created us, uh, for who he created us to be in his image and his likeness, where we are, you know, that whole beings, complete beings uh, in uh, in God, in Christ, uh, and just experiencing the fullness of the uh, deity. Now, people, uh, you know, basically argue that this, uh, uh, this substitutionary suffering of Christ or this vicarious suffering, again, vicarious means, uh, you know, in our place on behalf of somebody else, seeing somebody else, you know, uh, going through the suffering that we have to go through. Okay, so the vicarious suffering or the substitutionary suffering of Christ is very unjust. Um, but, you know, they forget when they say that, you know, it was very unjust of him to take upon our suffering. They forget that there are two reasons why people uh, endure suffering in this world. One reason is because of justice. And the other reason is love, okay? So justice and love. Now we often suffer because we ourselves are not innocent, uh, or because we have committed sin. Uh, and we also uh, suffer because of the, uh, you know, uh, because of we live in a very fallen world. We share the, the cause of pain in this fallen world. So this is justice. Justice is because we, we go through uh, suffering, we go through pain because of um, our own sin, because we are not innocent, we are not perfect, we sin. And also we live in a fallen world where there is pain, where there is suffering. Uh, but to suffer in service um, uh, to God is a demonstration of love. And this uh, greatest and highest form of suffering was seen in in Christ who was the suffering servant uh, who became our suffering lamb who became our sub substitutionary suffering in place of uh, us so when Christ suffered on the cross 
his suffering was not just substitutionary, it was not just vicarious uh, suffering, but it was something that was a voluntary uh, thing that Christ did for us. Voluntary, he took upon himself, you know, our sins, he died in our place, it was voluntary. Uh, he he just obeyed the will of the uh, father so you know in the human experience uh, you know the highest and the holiest form of love uh, is when an innocent person is willing to take on the blame for others and an innocent person is willing to take on uh, the 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 uh, uh, the, the penalty for uh, the consequences for the other person's wrongdoing, the wrong action, or breaking of the uh, law. And this is, uh, a, the human is, is seen as something as the highest and the holiest uh, form of love. And so the highest and the holiest form of love is seen on the cross when Jesus who was perfectly sinless, who was perfectly innocent, uh, was willing to take upon our sins, our blame. And that is why scripture says, greater love has no man than this, uh, that a man lay down his life for his um, uh, friend. Okay, so uh, this is what Christ did for us. He voluntarily uh, suffered in our place. He did this because, you know, he laid down his life because of, because that he because he loved us uh, uh, so much he did all of this out of love for us so scripture also reveals this that it was god's love that prompted the father to send the son uh, that uh, you know that the father thought about giving up his own son uh, in our place so that we can come to that position where he wants us to be to come to that place where Christ is so it was God's love that prompted uh, to sacrifice his only son and it was Christ's love the second person of the Trinity you know he is God himself so it was Christ who is God his love for us uh, that you know took him to that cross to be that suffering servant, suffering lamb, uh, and uh, to make that substitutionary suffering uh, in our place. Isn't that wonderful that this God's love is the greatest and the highest form of love that we can see, the holiest form of love that we can see in God the Father, in giving up his son, in putting the sins of the whole world upon his son, and seeing his son suffer on the cross, and the highest and the holiest form of love is when Christ, uh, you know, took our place and suffered uh, in our place. Okay, so there are. We will look at just three references that talks about, uh, you know, that reveal God's love for us that prompted Christ's substitutionary suffering. One is Romans chapter five, verse eight. So one of you can. Please read Romans 5 verse 8. Someone else can read 1 John 3 16. And someone else can read 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 14 and 15. Okay. So can uh, one of you please read uh, Romans 5 8 please. Mm. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, Rin. I think I heard Nickel's voice. So, Nickel, you can read 1 John 3, 16. By this, we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Thank you, Anand. He meant that. And Second Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. Can someone else read that, please? For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Amen. Thank you, Nina Santosh. Uh, we'll just take a break now, a uh, 10 minute break, and then we'll come back after the break and look at uh, these scripture passages. Okay, thank you, everyone. <laughs> 